profile some, you guessed it, extraordinary Catholics. We all know that there are various Catholic churches in the world. We're familiar with the ordinary Catholics who comprise the largest Catholic churches, including the Roman Catholic Church with over 1 billion followers. The second largest Catholic Church is the Greek Orthodox Church, which excommunicated the Roman Church in 1054, a fascinating history. And there are several other smaller Catholic churches, often referred to as autocephalous or independent Catholic churches, which share valid sacraments, but are free from the strictures and structures of those larger Catholic churches. So let's meet someone from one of those smaller independent Catholic churches. Today we have the pleasure of meeting an extraordinary Catholic who serves as Bishop of the old Catholic province of the United States and is pastor of St. Joseph Parish in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Welcome Bishop Michael Scalzi. Father Jamie, so great to see you and talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. What a delight to be with you here, Bishop Michael. Tell us about the story of your vocation to serve God's people. Oh my, that's a, that's a really beautiful question. Thank you for asking me. Um, I have to tell you, and I don't think this is an unusual answer, Father Jamie, that my I felt that my vocation started when I was a very, very small boy. Um, I remember f as far back as being six years old and having a desire for the priesthood. And as I got older, of course, you go through the uh, the years as an altar server. And um, I stayed very close to the, I was part of the Roman Catholic Church for my almost entire life until I joined the independent movement. And, um, and I was uh, really committed to becoming a Roman Catholic priest. And I went through uh, 12 years of Catholic school, mm -hmm. but during my high school years, which was at uh, Seton Hall High School in Patchogue, New York, mm -hmm. um, I started dating girls. Uh -oh. Uh oh. And yeah, it was an uh oh situation because all of a sudden I started wondering, now wait a second, I really like the idea of getting married and having a family and um, and the whole idea of being committed to a celibate life seemed like it was going to be too much of a struggle for me. So um, I did that. I mean, I, I went through high school and college. I was in the uh, broadcasting business for 25 years, and I did end up getting married and uh, had three children. And um, sadly, the, the marriage fell apart after 15 years. And so I went to went through sort of a, a discernment period, like, OK, I'm I'm not married anymore. I still have my family, of course, still have my children. But um, what about this vocation that I had many, many years ago? So I uh, went to my local pastor because I was part of a Roman Catholic parish here in the Harrisburg area. And I sat down with him. And I said, you know, I've always had this desire for priesthood. And now that I'm not married anymore, um, what do you think? And he said to me, oh, he says, that would be a scandal. I said, Sc I had not heard that word in a long time. I said, scandal, what, what do you mean? He says, oh, we could, we could never ordain someone who is a divorced person to the priesthood. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. And then, um, so the conversation kind of didn't go anywhere. And then a few weeks later, I got a letter from the vocations director of the diocese. And he said to me, my understanding is that you're interested in the priesthood. And, you know, we're always looking for good people. And I had been very active in the Roman diocese and in my parish. And he said, we, um, we might be able to work something out for you we would probably send you to a diocese out in the western part of the United States. But the stipulation would be that you could not have any contact with your children ever again. And I said, um, what? And so I immediately said, that's that's ridiculous. So I was a little crestfallen, Father Jamie. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I was sort of getting to the point where I was thinking maybe maybe this could happen. And when I got that letter, um, I, I thought, well, God's telling me that that's not going to happen. So back in the early 1990s, we had a major blizzard here in the Harrisburg area. 
And um, I was home for three days, not too dissimilar to what's going on in the United States these days. But I was home for three days and I got caught up on a lot of reading and uh, correspondence. And I was reading in the back of um, the National Catholic Reporter that there was an independent Catholic church forming and they wanted to uh, be in touch with people who felt they had a vocation to the priesthood, but were single, married, gay, straight, uh, no matter what their lifestyle was, they were interested in talking to them. So I called the phone number and spoke to the bishop of the church, and that was where the story all began. That was, uh, that was over 25 years ago, and so I was ordained in an independent Catholic church, and then the story goes on from there. Incredible. So you found out about independent Catholicism through the NCR, the National Catholic Reporter. Yeah, just a little small box ad, Father Jamie, in the, in the back of the magazine, yeah. That is absolutely fascinating. So I have to ask you, Bishop Michael, uh, I talked in the introduction about independent Catholicism. There are various people in our movement who self-identify in different ways. Um, you know, there, in 1889, there were various independent Catholics who came together and called themselves old Catholics. Can I ask, how do you self-identify? Do you self-identify as old Catholic and or as independent Catholic? And what does that self-identification mean for you? Well, Father Jamie, I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes, you know, as you know, there's there's gray lines between different things, and I'm not sure that that those two terms are necessarily um, mutually exclusive in many ways. Because um, I could say, well, independent from what? Mm -hmm. And of course, our church, which is the old Catholic Church, province of the United States, is a uh, is a nationwide jurisdiction, and we do align ourselves with the polity of old Catholicism. We are, we are not part of the old Catholic Church of Utrecht. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in many ways you could say that, that we're independent, but independent of the Roman Church or independent of the Episcopal Church. Um, and, and also I'm finding that as the years have gone on, that so many of these uh, churches that used to be considered independent mm -hmm. are now um, becoming very friendly with each other. Um, you know, I, I hearken to the beautiful gathering you had in the fall last year in Austin, where you brought so many different people together. And I don't think your goal was to get everybody to, to join together as one church, but you did uh, have a goal, if I'm speaking correctly, of just, just getting people under the same tent and talking and learning about each other and seeing if at the very, very least that maybe just friendships can be made and people can um, talk to each other. And, um, you know, I, I like to meet uh, men and women who are bishops and priests from other jurisdictions, because if my parishioners go on vacation and they say to me, well, I'm going on vacation in Austin, Texas. Do you know of a church that we could attend while we're there? I could say, yes, you can go see my good friend, Father Jamie and attend mass. And so I think that's that's the beautiful thing about all this. So, so I independent to me, I, I get that, but I, I just want to make sure that, that everybody watching us today understands that, that my view of independent is not that we can't have anything to do with each other because I think we can, and we need to. There you go. I still really appreciate that clarification, Bishop Michael, you know, so many of us in this movement self-identify in different ways, but we share more in common than that which will ever divide us. That gathering that you referenced here in Austin, Texas in October, it brought together 37 of us from different jurisdictions from throughout the United States. And it was just a beautiful time of building relationship together. I get those same questions here in Austin, Texas, where people ask me, Father Jamie, I'm going on vacation or I'm traveling to this or that place. You know, where can I go to mass? in a place that's not Roman Catholic. So it left me struggling. I pulled together a spreadsheet now with over 1,500 of us clergy in the English speaking world who are part of the independent sacramental movement. So it's exciting now just being able to connect with one another. I know, and I, I have to tell you, Father Jamie, I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate the work that went into that. Um, I actually have it as an icon on my desktop because I refer to it. 
And uh, and I thank you so much for all all you did for putting that together. That was so helpful. Yeah, my pleasure. So, Bishop Michael, we know that you're part of Chacusa, the old Catholic Church province in the United States. Here in Austin at our gathering in October, we had the pleasure of having with us Bishop Rosemary, who is a part of Chacusa as well. So here in Austin, we learned a little bit about Chacusa, but for the sake of all of our listeners today, tell us all about Chacusa, the old Catholic Church province in the United States. What do we need to know about y'all? Well, um, we're, we're a young church, but of course, so many jurisdictions are young. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary uh, in the fall of of last year in September as well. And um, Takusa came together uh, over about a two, two and a half year period. It wasn't something that happened overnight, but um, I had attended um, a meeting of the Conference of North American Old Catholic Bishops in Camden, New Jersey. And that's going back, Father Jamie, probably, I wanna say about 13 years ago. And um, there was a, a good number of bishops uh, who attended. And the meeting went well, and it went poorly. There were people who came to the meeting who were specifically there to, um, I think, get people to sign up with them. They, they weren't interested in dialogue. They were interested in numbers. So as the meeting progressed, fewer and fewer people uh, were left. And um, there was an, a representative there from the Episcopal Church. Uh, his name was uh, it still his father, Tom Ferguson, and he was the ecumenical officer for the church. And so as, as the days progressed and more and more people, not more and more people left, but, but a few people left, what remained were people who were very committed to doing uh, exactly what I was talking about before, you know, establishing friendships and relationships and that sort of thing. Well, while we were there and I was part of a different group, it was actually at the time called the American Catholic Church of New England. Um, I was there with a couple of folks from our church and I met um, some, some other bishops who were were independent, and I'll use that word specifically. They were they were all by themselves. Mm -hmm. They had parishes and they had priests, but they were very very small. So of course, over meals and uh, at sitting up late at night talking, we thought, you know, I wonder if we could all do something together. So there was a group of us who decided that what we were going to do is we were going to meet a number of months later down in Washington D.C., mm -hmm. and we were going to bring representatives from our church especially laity. We were going to bring laity with us because we wanted them to feel that they were part of this. So we met in Washington, had a wonderful meeting for a very long weekend, and it went so well that we decided that a number of months later, we were going to meet in California. And we did, and we agreed and formed the old Catholic Church province of the United States, known as Takusa. And um, we have uh, four bishops now. Uh, one is retired. And uh, we've been going along pretty well over all these years. We've had no, uh, <laughs> no major blow-ups or anything like that that sometimes happens with independent Catholicism. And, uh, um, and we're doing quite well. Thank you. Awesome. I really appreciate the update on Takusa, especially for those listeners who've not been exposed to Takusa, the old Catholic Church province in the United States. I know that in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area, you have a parish as well. You're the pastor of St. Joseph. Tell us all about your ministry there at St. Joseph. Well, uh, when I was ordained to the priesthood, and that was back in 1994, um, I was born on the Feast of St. Joseph, which happens to be tomorrow. So um, when I was uh, ordained to the priesthood, the bishop who ordained me said, now you're going to go back home and start a parish. I was in upstate New York at the time for my ordination. And he said, you're going to start a parish. What are you going to call it? And I had always dreamed that someday if I was going to be a priest, that I would honor uh, my patron saint, uh, which happens to also be my middle name. 
that uh, I would start a parish and name him, uh, name the parish after him. So we have the parish of St. Joseph. It's been in existence here in Harrisburg for 25 years and, um, and we're doing well. We rent space from an MCC church, Metropolitan Community Church of the Spirit in downtown Harrisburg. And we're doing a lot of great community work with them. Uh, it's a it's a really great relationship, and we're like one family. So it uh, they're small, we're small, and uh, and together we're doing big things. That is really awesome. Thanks for letting us know of that. So for those of us who are traveling in your direction, I'm imagining you all have Sunday masses that that we could join if we found ourselves in the area of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Well, with the coronavirus uh -oh. that's going on now. Uh, our services, uh, our, our physical services, Father Jamie, our masses uh, are all suspended. So what we're doing is we're doing a virtual service, which is going to be held on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. But once this pandemic ends, and and please God, let it end soon with, with no more deaths and, um, and people who are getting ill, we pray for that. Um, we will go back to our normal mass schedule, which is at noon on Sundays. Okay, tremendous. Tell us, Bishop Michael, have you been involved in other ministries through the years? So we understand that you're now involved in parish ministry. Um, any other ministries that you might mention that you've been involved in? Well, uh, right after I was ordained, I wanted to do something outside of, because I had a secular job and I wanted to do something outside of that. The secular job was really something that I was using simply to support myself. So um, once again, I found an ad in a newspaper that was, uh, they were looking for a nursing home chaplain. And so I applied for that and I was blessed to get that job. And that started a 20 year career in the healthcare industry. Wow. I moved from being chaplain at a number of area nursing homes to then doing hospice chaplaincy, which I did for uh, the good part of 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that I have to tell you, Father Jamie, and I know you have experience with that as well. For anyone who is involved in a hospice program, either as a chaplain or a volunteer or nursing, social work, it's so incredibly rewarding and fulfilling. Um, each night I would come home and just think, wow, what a, what a day this has been because you meet some of the most incredible people and their family and friends. So um, I did hospice work. I was, um, as part of a CPE program, I was a chaplain at uh, the Hershey Med Center for a year. And uh, so I did a lot in the healthcare industry, yeah. Tremendous. In all those years of ministry, Bishop Michael, what have been some of the greatest joys that you've experienced in ministry? Oh, Father Jamie, um, is this interview going to go on for hours and hours and hours? Because I, 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 we have right. I, I would need that amount of time to tell you that, um, and I don't, I don't say this lightly. I, I was honored and humbled to be at the bedside of people as they were ending their lives and helping their families through the grieving process. There were so many people that I've lost count, people who, and I don't take credit for this at all, but so many people who uh, came to the Lord because of our conversations and, and being together and um, the different um, uh, conversations we had and experiences we had. And um, it was just a, it was just a, an awesome, awesome time in my life. And I will, I mean, I look back on it. I, I look back on it with great emotion and great fondness that uh, it was truly such an incredible blessing to be allowed to, uh, to minister to people and, and help them during that time of their lives. Right. What an incredible ministry that is too, Bishop Michael. Just really appreciate your drawing our attention to that ministry, especially for, for some of us who are clergy, you know, we're doing, we're out ministering on a daily basis and we really don't realize the impact of our ministry. I know when my father passed now almost three years ago, just the presence of that chaplain to my family and to all of us was just really a beautiful thing, you know, for us to be there and present to one another and ministering to families in need and to those who are transitioning from this life to the next. Wow, could words ever capture the beauty and the holiness of those moments? 
And Father Jamie, would you agree with me that when you had this experience with your father, that that your role there was to be his son and not necessarily need to be the priest or the minister at the time, that to have somebody else there to fulfill that role allowed you to be the son and go through that process and not have to worry about, I mean, I'm sure. Sure, you can through that, but yeah. to have uh, that comforting presence there wasn't wasn't exactly. that a wonderful thing? It was, and the other the other beautiful thing about it is that those who work in that ministry of chaplaincies have often been through CPE or clinical pastoral education. I'm going to be honest; I know a lot of things, especially about theology, but I've never done a CPE myself. So I admire and esteem the gifts of those who've been through those programs and who minister with a real grace that I don't pretend to have. I use all the knowledge and all the skills that I have, but at the same time, those who've been through those training programs in CPE, classical, uh, clinical pastoral education, I hold y'all in high, high esteem. Yeah, it's never too late, Father Jamie. And I have a candidate right now for priesthood uh, in, our, in our diocese. And ironically, just yesterday, he and I were talking about CPE. And I told him that I probably um, I'm going to ask him over the next couple of years to to do CPE because it is life changing. So um, anyone who's watching and listening, if you have the opportunity and even if you don't feel you have uh, the spirituality for it, just do it. Just do it. And it's literally life changing. There you go. You spoke about some of the joys of ministry, Bishop Michael. Do you mind my asking in your years of ministry, what have been some of the greatest challenges in serving the people of God? Well, Jamie, I try not to um, think back too much about some of the, the negatives that have happened. I mean, I could I could dwell on, um, you know, the fact that when we first uh, started our parish here in the Harrisburg area, the Roman Catholic Diocese was not very happy with the fact that we were uh, coming into existence and did some things that were were really very, very hurtful. Um, I, I almost lost a job at a nursing home because the Roman Diocese um, came after me under their one of their previous bishops who has uh, gone on to the Lord. Um, but it was a very difficult time trying to get our parish up and running when we were getting bombarded with all this negativity. But we tried very hard to just keep going, and we did. Um, I, I would have to say, Father Jamie, that probably the, the challenges are just the world that we live in today. I think this is the most challenging time in terms of people um, not being churched, that, that faith, spirituality, belonging to a faith community, supporting that faith community seems to be such a low priority in people's lives that they, they come to us for sacraments, which of course we're more than happy to provide. Um, but I always do that in the hopes that maybe they could find a spiritual home. If a couple asks me to do their wedding, more than happy to do it. I mean, we, we bless, um, same-sex marriages, we bless uh, heterosexual marriages. I mean, it it doesn't matter, but I, I do it, and I, I always invite the couple to please at least come to Mass and, and sample us, and so very few of them do. They, they promise that they'll see you when they get back from their honeymoon, and then you never hear from them again until it's time for their baptisms, and then they have their children baptized. So I try not to be cynical about that, but it is a very challenging situation when people come uh, only for uh, their own needs and not maintain a relationship with with our faith community. So that that probably to me would be um, the biggest challenge these days. There you go. And I think like you, Bishop Michael, I think I tend to focus on the positives of all that. You know, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people here in Austin. We just find there are a lot of people who come for the sacraments of the church. And we really don't see them after that. But what a grace to be able to be with them and their families, to be able to celebrate those sacraments that are so important to them and their families. That's true. That's absolutely true. So kind of uh, have to balance things out, right? Yeah. 
Bishop yeah. Michael, I'm going off script because you have such a rich uh -oh. history in independent Catholicism. This is my question for you. I'm wondering, you had mentioned the American Catholic Church in New England. What I'm thinking is, as you mentioned a name like that, there's so much about the history of independent Catholicism that is not published, that's not available online. Is there anything that you might tell us about that and or any ju other jurisdiction that you've been part of or that you've known that maybe we wouldn't be able to find on the internet or in other places? You know, anything, any memories that you might be able to share of, of past jurisdictions? And then after that, the next question I'll ask you is about past persons who've been involved in independent Catholicism, simply so that those of us who are more new to this, I've only been in the, in the independent Catholic movement for eight years. So I really don't have any memory before that. And it's difficult to find online sources. Tell us anything that you can about the history that you've had and any of the jurisdictions um, that you may have been part of and or that you might wish to share about. You know, a lot of what I remember, Father Jamie, is not pretty. I'm sorry to say that, but I, I want to be truthful to you and to our audience that um, I found through the through the years, and this is prior to Takusa coming into existence. And this is I'm not painting with a broad brush. This is not to indict uh, other independent churches, but I was part of two other churches before I became part of Takusa. And Takusa for me was going to be the last stand because the other two churches the relationship I had with the archbishop and the bishop in those churches, um, it didn't end well. And it didn't end well for a lot of people, not just myself, that um, in independent Catholicism, sadly, there's a tremendous amount of ego. And I know to be in ministry, you have to have a healthy ego. You have to be able to um, you know, get up in front of large groups, you need to have self-confidence and all that. But when the um, the ego takes over and and someone's eyes are taken off Jesus Christ and put on themselves, that's when everything falls apart. And that sadly was what the case was with the two previous churches that I belong to. Um, and then I met a wonderful man. His name was Bishop Stephen Burke, and he's gone on to the Lord. And he and I came together and we uh, we started the American Catholic Church of New England. And actually, Bishop Rosemary Ananis, who you just mentioned a, a few minutes ago, she became part of us, too. So we had three bishops that were part of our church and then the American Catholic Church of New England um, morphed into joining Takusa and our church, and I'm very proud of this, is very solid, very stable. It's genuine. It's sincere. The priests, bishops, laity in our church, uh, all the priests and bishops are involved in ministries and many of the laity are as well. And I think that's one of the things that really is the sign as to whether or not a church is genuine. Look, you know, peel away the onion and see if the archbishop or bishop, whoever is in charge of this church, what's their life, what's their ministerial lifestyle like? Um, are they sitting in an apartment somewhere in a major city and doing nothing but playing church, playing archbishop? Um, I came across a guy who invited me a number of years ago to come visit him at his home. And he took me into one of these huge walk-in closets. And he had copes and chasubles and albs and stoles and miters. It looked like a Catholic Kmart. It was unbelievable. I mean, just, just hundreds of items. And then... Um, he invited me to attend mass. There were six priests on the altar and one woman sitting in the congregation. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people get wrapped up in that. They're, they're involved in, in all of the, the dress up and the extraneous things that, um, you know, all that is fine. I mean, that's, if you want to get, you know, dressed up nicely for the Lord, that's okay. I, I get that. But, 
but where are the people? Who, who are you ministering to? What, what are you doing this for? Are you doing this for yourself or are you doing this to help people? You know, what is your ministry like? So, um, so I ask anybody who's interested in independent Catholicism, and, you know, I've come across people who feel that they've, they have a vocation. Well, contact someone and uh, look them up on the Internet and, and make an appointment to meet with them. But look beneath the surface. See what that person is doing for the people of God before you make any commitment. Amen. So speaking of persons, then I have to ask you, I asked about any jurisdictions. What about persons in your experience of independent Catholicism? You've been in independent Catholicism longer than many of us. Any particular bright lights that you'd like to share with us so that we can say that we've heard their names and we might be able to maybe explore who they are a bit more? I'm going to limit it to one, and that doesn't mean that there are no others, Father Jamie. But I do want to single out the Ecumenical Catholic Communion. Uh, bishop uh, Frank Krebs is their presiding bishop, okay. and they have a number of other bishops as well. Um, we have uh, begun a wonderful relationship with them, mm -hmm. and they have all of the uh, hallmarks of a, a great church. I mean, they are genuine. They are sincere. They're out there doing ministry. And um, I think you and I have talked about uh, the uh, Independent Catholic Bishops Forum mm -hmm. that we met uh, together last year in St. Louis. If I'm right, Father Jamie, I, I believe it was the week right before uh, your conference was held in it Austin. Was. So yeah. it was in October, and I'm going to pull up a photo. Tell us all about that gathering. That was unbelievable. That was uh, something that to this day, I'm still on cloud nine about because we had a number of bishops from, I, I believe there were six jurisdictions, if I have the numbers correctly. And they were, we all got along like we had known each other for years. And many of us had only met uh, for that weekend in St. Louis. And what was really exciting, Father Jamie, is if you look at the photo, there is uh, a lady in the front with uh, shoulder length blonde hair. Uh, that is Reverend Margaret Rose. She is the ecumenical officer for the Episcopal Church in the United States. And to her right and the viewing left is Bishop Michelle Klusmeyer, who is the bishop, the Episcopal Bishop in West Virginia. And it was an incredible honor that the both of them were invited and attended this meeting because we do a lot of good work with the Episcopal Church. We find ourselves very closely aligned with the Episcopal Church and have made many friends. So, so they came to see what this gathering was all about, and they were our honored guests and um, it was so great to have them there. They said that they were leaving that conference and going home to be able to tell all their counterparts that there is uh, an old Catholic movement in the United States and it's alive and well. And they, they told us they were very impressed. Very cool. Really appreciate you sharing with us about that, uh, that movement, because I understand in many ways it was historic. That is say in your time of being in the independent Catholic movement, can you think of other times where there have been similar encounters, or was this, in fact, a first of its kind? Father Jamie, there have been attempts in the past, and I've attended many of them. And I'm sorry to say that almost all of them fell apart. And it was because people came to the conference, whatever conference they attended, they came with their own agenda. Their reason for going, as I said before, when we had that uh, that meeting in New Jersey, uh, some of the people who came were not coming to see how we could have more cohesion amongst us. They were coming to increase their own church's numbers. And when they found that there was no interest, they left. There were a couple of people that came to that conference that uh, we all had dinner together at night. They never said a word. And we found out that they left in the dark of the night and they were not there the next morning. Wow. Um, so, so there have been a number of experience in the, experiences in the past. And I look to what happened in uh, St. Louis this past year and then the uh, gathering you had in Austin 
I, I look at that, Father Jamie, both of those as signs of hope that maybe um, there are, not maybe, I think there are, there are a lot of good people out there, yourself included, who are sincere about the work that they're doing and the people they're contacting and, and the people of God that we're trying to help. So if we can come together and maybe leave our egos outside at the door and uh, come inside and let our hair down and just talk and just be sisters and brothers with each other, we could get a lot of great work done. Amen to that, brother. Here in Austin, at least, our, our focus has been on building relationships, which is why I so greatly appreciate your time at speaking with us today. As we begin to wrap up, I'd like to just have like an open mic session of just anything that you'd like to, to say, Bishop Michael, about yourself, about your ministry, anything else that you'd like to, to tell us, we'd love to hear it. Well, if I could just be serious just for one second, Father Jamie, um, I'm going to be turning 66 tomorrow. Happy and birthday. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I say that because I've, I've dedicated almost my whole life to church work uh, as, as a lay person and then as an ordained priest in the old Catholic church and a, and a bishop. Um, I don't want to see the work that I've done uh, go to waste. And, you know, I look to, uh, to young guys like you, and it gives me hope. It gives me hope for the future that what we're handing down to uh, people in your age group, the up-and-comers, will be the ones that will continue to carry the torch and will continue doing this work of independent Catholicism. It doesn't matter whether it's old Catholic new Catholic, American Catholic, it, it doesn't matter. It's still under that tent of independent Catholicism that, that, that people like you, men and women like you and others will realize that they have a vocation and that they, they want to roll up their sleeves and, and help people. I mean, look at the times that we're living in. If there was ever a time when uh, our country, the world needed God and needed um, a place where people could turn to, it's certainly now. Amen. Bishop Michael, we so greatly appreciate your time today. Do you mind Thank if you. I ask you to lead us in a closing prayer? Well, I have something that I wanted to share, and I have, I just received this today, okay. and I have no idea who this person is, but it's attributed to somebody named Kitty O'Meara. Okay. And it goes like this, and it's about the um, uh, pandemic that we're experiencing right now, Father Jamie. Okay. She writes, and this is, this is short, and the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows, and the people began to think differently, and the people healed, and in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal, and when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices, and dreamed new images, and created new ways to live, and heal the earth fully, as they have been healed. Amen. Amen to that brother. Bishop Michael Scalzi, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for telling us all about St. Joseph Parish in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and about Tecusa, the old Catholic Church province of the U.S., but most of all, Bishop Michael, thank you for reminding us that all of us, if we wanted to, could be extraordinary Catholics. Appreciate you, brother. It's been an honor. Have a good day.